Hey everyone, welcome back to Bit White of the Podcast, and we have such sights to show you today. We're talking about Hellraiser. As always, I am Kate, and Adrian is not here today, but Alex is. Yeah, what's up? It's me. And Matt. Hello. So, it is month of Alex, month of spookies. Yes. And I decided that Hellraiser, or I don't remember how Hellraiser came into the conversation to be an episode, but I was very excited because uh, just to go right off the bat, Hellraiser is one of my formative horror movies. Um, it's where I fell in love with practical effects and some real bad things. <laughs> We're going to talk about it. Cannot um, wait. <laughs> so, Alex, um, although I am sure our listeners know who you are by now, if they aren't, I question if they've listened to an, uh, many episodes. Yeah. But uh, why don't you explain why you're here? Uh, I am the assignment editor for Friday.com. We're actually in the middle of our own October event of just doing a daily review or article about something horror related uh, since we do horror and genre film. And I'm just a general spooky boy and also a wholesome boy. That's the other part of my brand if you've listened to the show. Uh, but yeah, I just I like horror movies a lot and I'm always happy to talk about them. So you make heads roll and then you hug them. Exactly. <laughs> So our number one question, our first question, not number one, but our first question today our only is, question. A, do you know who Pinhead is? Sure do. Uh, yeah. I guess I'll go first of like, I know who he is, as in like, I could recognize him. And obviously he had pins in his head. Um, so original. But do you know his backstory? <laughs> I don't know anything else about that. I just know what he looks like. And I feel like I've seen him like in the cartoons of like Robot Chicken where he gets stuck on everything with all the pins in his head. All right. But that's, that's, we're Fair. good. We're doing it. Alex? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, you know, Pinhead is that, I, like, I, I don't want to say he's quite the antagonist of the Hellraiser movies, but kind of. I don't know. It's a very, like, ethereal, like, it's not really like man versus Pinhead, but more like man versus desire, and Pinhead's just throwing himself in the mix. Like, yeah. I, I, at least the first Hellraiser. The other ones, maybe less so. But the first one, it's like, he's just sort of there. So I would actually say Pinhead is the hero of the first Hellraiser. Yeah, I can see that. Because Frank is a POS. Yes. <laughs> that's No, that that's fair. Uh, and I want to say in his backstory, is he a World War I general or soldier I or something? he's a World War I general. I actually am sad because I didn't pull up the huge pinhead uh, backstory. It's ridiculous. It's like he solved a lament configuration and became a Cenobite. I don't know. It's weird. Also, do we, I mean, do we want to establish pronunciations now? <laughs> um, I do know that his proper name, uh, his God-given name, if you will, is, uh, is Hell Priest. Okay. That is what Clive Barker calls him. That is what only that is what clive barker only calls him and that is what nobody calls him i no. here's the thing that's what i want to call him now because that's such a better name than pinhead yep but i also honestly it's always kind of bugged me that they changed the title of the movie from the the inspiration or the source material but uh we'll get to that yeah so when we jump right into it uh so Hellraiser is based on Clive Barker's novella, or a short story, if you don't know what a novella is, The Hellbound Heart, which is a beautiful freaking name and actually does more to explain the movie than anything else. Right? Yeah. Because, man, this movie, like, I, I watched it for the first time a few years ago, and it blew me away. It is so good and, like, layered and deep. And then instead they're just like, oh, we're going to call it Hellraiser, and that guy's Pinhead, and there's his buddy Butterball. It's one of those things, and it, Hellraiser exists and lasts because of what it is, in spite of all of the marketing, like, working against it. Yep. Because there's, uh, like, as we start getting into it, there is so much about Hellraiser that is not friendly to general audiences. Like, oh, Hellraiser no, not at all. Like, Hellraiser is something that deep horror fans watch and love but something that general audiences watch and we're like one i'm disgusted two what the hell yep. and three i really wish i hadn't watched this and it's this and, and i'm not saying that to be gatekeepy because i think I, I firmly believe horror is the least gatekeepy genre mm -hmm. uh fandom out there 
but there was like this is like I would not recommend Hellraiser to people. No. Essentially. It is one of the horror classics, but I, I, I think that it's something you get into on like movie number ten that you've watched in the genre and very much not number one. Yeah, I would not start anybody off in the genre with Hellraiser. So all I think about with Pinhead outside of like Pins in the Head is Soundgarden. That is it. Perfect. No, that's that's good. That's really good. Would you like to explain for the audience? Go listen to Soundgarden. <laughs> Their entire discography. Eventually, you'll get it. Yes. <laughs> it only will take about three songs. <laughs> um. So, uh, Hellraiser as a series. Uh, the, their storylines focus on a puzzle box that opens a gateway to a hell-like realm of Cenobites. Which, again, Cenobites. Badass name. The actual names of individual Cenobites. Not Butterball. <laughs> Butterball, female Cenobite. Um, there's more. The I can't remember them, though. Which one? The Engineer. Oh, yeah. He has a real name. Um, see, Matt, there's science. All I think about is trilobites when you say cenobites. Trilobites are cute. Yeah. That we, anyway. that we know of. Uh, so, the, bo- the puzzle box opens a gateway to a hell-like realm of cenobites, an order of formerly human monsters who harvest human souls to torture in sadistic, sadistic experiments. Although Clive Barker wrote the original story and also wrote and directed the first film, he has not written or directed any of the seceding seceding prequels. Barker specifically stated that he signed away the story of the character rights to the production company before the first film, not realizing what a great success it would be. Um, But in addition to that, there is a lot that uh, Clive Barker did not want them to do with the character that the studio took in its own way. So, uh, like, for me, Hellbound isn't terrible, which is the second one, but, like, I really only acknowledge Hellraiser. Yeah, I, I've only, I've only you know, dabbled in, in this specific franchise so much because there are, like, what, ten movies at this point? Ten. Yeah, and from what I read online, most people seem to draw the line after two or three at the very latest. Yeah. And three is like a rare one that people are like, oh yeah, that one's still really good. So how do we get the other seven? Greed. Money. <laughs> uh, also, I do think this is apl- applied to about 50% of our episodes where somebody may sign away their rights, not knowing what was going to happen, and then live to regret it. You guys done an Alan Moore episode yet? <laughs> No, one? we haven't. Maybe when maybe when Watchmen launches on HBO, that's the time to do it. But man, talk about getting a raw deal. Yeah, talked about and a we'll lot of raw too, deals on this podcast. One of the things that one one of the reasons why I also really don't like the progression of uh of hell of the Hellraiser films is they change the look of Pinhead so much. Um, oh, like interesting. The one that he has in Judgment is like Judgment's the most recent one from 2018. Time out, time out. They have a movie that came out last year. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't okay. good, but... Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, like, I, I got nothing else. Yeah. No, this is still going. Um, again, people only ever talk about the first one that came out in 1987. That's about the only uh, one I know of. It's really the only one that matters. Um, so when we look at uh, Hellraiser, uh, the origins of Pinhead as a character come from a 1973 play where the guy who plays Pinhead, Doug Bradley, um, he played a Dutchman who was a torturer. And then uh, Clive Barker used that as the base for Pinhead. Um the care and then uh yeah so from bradley the character i played in hunters the dutchman i can see echoes of later pinhead in hellraiser the strange strange character who has whose head was kind of empty but who conveyed all kinds of things in the so there is a two-part documentary or it's, it's essentially one documentary but it's like four hours long so it's cut into two parts it's available on shutter called leviathan 
it goes into casting Doug Bradley as Pinhead. Um, and it was all about his voice. Uh, oh. Because they wanted they wanted Pinhead to be regal and almost seductive. Um, but with a focus on uh, an, on kind of portraying that royalty. Um, and it was also one of the reasons why they chose to put him in a floor-length gown versus uh, pants. Because they wanted it to look as he was like he was floating on the surface. Yeah, it's very, very elegant. And now I'm just in my head imagining like a version of Pinhead that's more like Jared Leto's Joker. Oh. <laughs> like if they hadn't given him like the accent or the refinement or anything. Um, uh, sir. Uh, uh, I thought I'm Matt would gonna, get more angry at me for that. <laughs> I'm going to uh, hold on. I think I'm just disappointed. <laughs> That is essentially what we get with uh, 2018's Pinhead. Oh, no. I'm not ready for this. He's muddied and dark and has a Why? Weird... This is terrible. Yeah. I'm assuming it's in the show notes. It, no, it's in the... It's. Uh, I'll put it in the show notes. I and also, that. man, that the practical effects on the chest wound are not good. No, they're not at all. Uh, I'm assuming 2018 so, version went straight BOD. Yes. Okay. Oh, oh, almost all of the Hellraisers have gone straight to BOD. <laughs> I don't know. We're still counting them. I thought we just quit counting BODs after a while. No, VOD has become a more legitimate platform since the internet. Has it? Yes, yeah. it has. Especially okay. before. Okay. Like, look at, like Netflix is essentially VOD. It's just that you're already subscribed. Yeah. Yeah, but I don't get anything that looks like that. I mean, you do. You just don't watch it. <laughs> yeah, Netflix has a lot of bad movies. <laughs> I guess that's the point. I just don't watch them. So I have that option. I don't have to pay the VOD money to watch that. That's true. <laughs> that's okay. That's fair. I can't get mad at you for that. Um, now that I have showed you what they've turned Pinhead into... It's real not good. It's very not good. Um, that is why Bradley was cast. It was all about his voice. It was about his height. It was about just the fact that he was a real British actor. So uh, this uh, Hellraiser, the first film, comes out in 1987, which at the time in horror, you were looking for the prettiest people to play because mm -hmm. they were going to be killed anyway. So you weren't actually, and you had a whole bunch of silent killers. You, you yeah. weren't looking for people to act. You were looking for people to be fodder or to be a monster. And when Clive Barker and his team were casting for Hellraiser, he very deliberately sought out actors. So like Doug Bradley is a trained actor, like a trained British yeah. actor. And it is one of the things that you feel in Hellraiser. Mm -hmm. And it is what sets Hellraiser apart from all the other horror films that come out in that 80s decade. So yeah, I do want to say, I was going to say, sorry, Alex. Um, can you at least explain the difference between like train actor versus what we get in general? Because obviously we know what we're referring to. But for those of you who don't understand the difference between British trained actors and basically what yeah. we do here in the States at the time. So... <laughs> British actors, <laughs> the majority of the time, go through years of being in plays, actually being trained theater actors before they make it to acting on the screen. By comparison, Jason Mewes, when he first played Jay in uh, Clerks, was just a guy that Kevin Smith knew. <laughs> exactly. Why and I only I know him because I, ju I just listened to an interview with him, but he talked about how, like, Literally, Kevin Smith wrote that character based on who Jason was as a teenager and then was like, I can't imagine anybody else playing this role. It's literally you. <laughs> I mean, he's not wrong, which is why I wanted her to explain it because people don't seem to realize, like, there is, a, in different countries, you go, you actually train to be actors. They don't just find, yeah. find you. You, you don't get discovered in England. <laughs> you yeah. you yeah. have to work. <laughs> That's why, like, failed British actors come to the U.S. and then are, like, top-billed actors here. <laughs> right. <laughs> They suck in the in the UK. Great right here. <laughs> um, but no, so like the reason this is it, it, to to put this to kind of like an eighties analogy for horror, you, the eighties is uh, debatably the pinnacle of uh, slashers. Um, 
<laughs> and when you look at the entire arc of people who played in those movies, it was just pretty. Is she yeah. pretty? Does she have nice boobs? Is he tall? Okay, cast him. People from 80s slashers that I can still name. Uh, Kevin Bacon? And that yeah. might be it. I can name Mark Patton. But, okay. Uh, and and only because Mark Patton, I saw his documentary. And uh, Jamie Lee Curtis, because you can't forget her. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's really, there. there's, like, I love, a, like, a good number of 80s slashers, and I cannot tell you anyone who was in them. I love Nightmare on Elm Street. That girl is Nancy. Oh, yeah. And, okay, so I Johnny Depp. Yeah, I was like, Jamie I thought Johnny Curtis. Depp played one. But I just knew he died. That's all I remember. Yeah, he turns into a blood volcano. We'll yeah. get to he it. He has one of the best deaths in That's the only reason I remember he's in that movie. The blood like, cano? We are legitimately going to be talking about Nightmare on Elm Street next week. So My okay, bad. We we, we're yeah, gonna we're... we're gonna put a pin in it. That's Kate, no it's... <laughs> Kate, come on. But spooky dad jokes. Yeah, okay, I, yeah, you're right. We should put a pin in it and move on. That that like that you said it's wholesome and spooky for you. That this I'm doing That's true. That thing. that joke is my brand, pretty much. <laughs> Um, so, uh, Barker's mid, uh, mid 1980s short story, The Forbidden, which was adapted into Candyman from his Book of Blood series, featured the first incarnation of Pinhead's Nails. Um, having been dismayed at prior cinematic adaptations of his work, Barker decided to attempt to direct the film himself, with Christopher Figg producing. And he made it with New World Pictures for nine hundred thousand dollars, which is a phenomenal budget. I mean, it's a shitty budget, but like a phenomenal budget for the amount of work and practical effects that are. In oh yeah, film. and also to be given that budget for your first film is actually yeah. like that's a huge number. And this is also one of the things that, like I said uh, before we started recording, that I found out about Clive Barker. Clive Barker straight up sh- said. Y'all don't know how to make my work. I'm just going to direct it myself. Love it. Which is like, yes. Um, and so uh, after that, Hellraiser ended up being filmed at the end of 1986 and was set to be made in seven weeks, but was extended over a nine to ten week period by New, Wor- New World. And the film was originally made under the working title of Sadomasochists from Beyond the Gate Grave, which is like an apt title for the movie. That is a ridiculous <laughs> title. Real quick, adjusting for inflation, he was given two point one million dollars to make that movie. To still put that into perspective, what in- Endgame was made on four hundred million dollars. Yeah, that's a good point, man. That really is nothing. <laughs> but uh, Get Out was only a million, right? Something like that. Yeah, it was pretty low budget. Yeah. I'm not saying that the film don't exist, but like to see like the difference of like what the difference between oh yeah, how much money companies will put into a movie. (laughs) Yes, yes. Netflix films get more money than what you just said. (laughs) Oh yeah, I mean right. I mean actors get paid more money to be in Netflix films than that entire budget. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. But like, and it's also one of those things when you put in perspective, uh, and and it's something that hits you when you actually watch the first film. Um, There's one of the very first practical effect scenes. Um, after the cold open is Frank coming back from the mm-hmm. dead and he oozes literally oozes up from the floorboards of the attic and you see bones being reshaped out of ooze and coming back together you see a brain being remade and you see it, it, it's it, it's a lot it's intense it's really intense and it's really well done yeah and it's like they did that on like nine hundred thousand dollars. Like, there's yeah. a lot of special effects in this movie. So they spent eight hundred thousand dollars on that scene, and then a hundred thousand dollars on the rest of the movie. Well, no, no, they spent seventy thousand dollars on craft services and thirty thousand dollars on the rest of the movie. <laughs> but no, I honestly, that number though is still like it is intimidating because I'm thinking like I've done podcasting for a few years now. If somebody approached me with two million dollars to make an audio documentary, I'd be like, no, thank you. That's too much money. I don't know where to spend that. That's fair. 
You buy a I very buy expensive. Mics. You buy a very expensive mic. Yes. <laughs> With my name engraved on it, so there's really no point in the company holding on to it. <laughs> you just have to give it back. Yeah. Uh, so Barker himself wanted to call the film Hellbound. Better call name. The name Hellbound Heart. Uh, but Christopher Figg, the producer on I think it's the first four movies, uh, suggested Hellraiser instead. What does that even mean, though? It has nothing to do with the film. <laughs> It's Other yeah, it's Frank very frustrating. Raises from the baseboards. Yes. <laughs> That's it. But nobody specifically raises hell in these movies. Mm -mm. Not at all. Um so Barker spoke fondly um in the documentary uh, the Hell the Hellraiser Chronicles about filming stating that the memories of production were of Unalloyed fondness. The cast treated my ineptitudes kindly, and the crew was no less forgiving. Barker admitted his own lack of knowledge on filmmaking, stating that he didn't know the difference between a, tel a 10 millimeter lens and a 35 millimeter lens. If you'd shown me a plate of spaghetti and said it was a lens, I might have believed you. <laughs> Ultimately, Excellent. after filming, New World convinced Barker to relocate the story to the United States, which required overdubbing to remove some of the British accents in the film. Because if you don't know, Hellraiser is supposed to be a British film. That is deeply frustrating. Yeah. But also, I imagine it would have been a harder sell to be like, yeah, you want to go see this weird foreign film, Hellraiser? Yeah, that's fair. Like Because, it's you know, a lot of people will have hang-ups over the term foreign film, so... Yeah. Even though it's from say, Britain... Actually, to be fair, it does seem easier to sell, hey, do you want to watch this foreign film about a guy who can't tell the difference between pain and pleasure? Or do you want to watch this American film about a guy who can't tell the difference between pain and pleasure? So you yeah, have to get fair. Soundgarden, I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> this is Matt's new Soundgarden fan cast. <laughs> um, oh, you know what would be a good podcast? Me and Alex just talk about horror movies, and Matt references a band to tell us what what band the horror movie is like. Uh, yes, absolutely. It's so niche, but I, I am a big fan of this idea. It'd be a lot it of fun. Great. <laughs> uh, during production, Doug Bradley had trouble hitting his marks during the takes in makeup, and as like, because he could not see through the black contact lenses. And he was afraid of tripping over pinhead skirts. The special effects of the unnamed creature known as the engineer in the novels proved difficult as the creature was difficult to maneuver. And there were other issues, which included a rush suit of uh, a rush shoot of the Chinese restaurant scene with Kirsty and Larry due to the lateness of the person responsible for letting the cast and crew into the establishment. So ultimately, this film was hella hard to make. Yeah, sounds like it. I made another pun. <sighs> Do they still have cell black contact lenses? I think so. Huh? Okay. What'd I know that was a fad for a while, but I don't know if they actually still do the colored contact lenses as much. Anymore. Oh, I don't know if the guitar player for Limp Bizkit counts as a fad. Well, I mean, uh, I feel no, like that. I feel like that would have been. Kids at Hot Topic counts as a fad. That's I know, true. but that was what? How many years ago now? Is it still there? I follow Instagram spooky people. It's got to still be there. This episode Come is on, now about If you about follow Mall Instagram Goths. spooky people, all you get is Hot Topic. Well, no, that was just the people who watched, who were doing that back then. <laughs> now it's like fashion. Anyway, so now that we've talked about all this production stuff, I'm going to give a quick rundown about the plot of the first Hellraiser because there are a lot of pieces of this movie that are just really good and really stick out cinematically. So in the original Hellraiser, Frank Cotton escapes from the uh, Cenobites when his brother Larry spill, uh, cuts his hand uh, on the spot where Frank died, opening uh, opening a puzzle box that opened a gateway to Cenobites. So essentially, they like move into Frank's house, uh, old house, and uh, there's like this really weird cold open where you see Frank die and get just get completely flayed, or not? It is not flayed, but like you see the hooks go into his skin. Yeah. And, it's real visceral. It's it's crazy. Um, 
And so he ends up getting brought back to life. And then with the help of Larry's wife, Julia, who had previously slept with Frank because knife play was something she liked, apparently. It was real weird. Uh, like, right after she married uh, Larry. Who was uh, not into knife play. No, not at all. It's like, it's this really weird thing where like Larry is like super, super tame. And then Frank is like the bad boy, but like the bad boy you don't want because he might kill you. Um, and ultimately with, uh, with Julia helping, Frank ends up uh, regenerating his body with the blood of the victims that Julia supplies him. So the way this works is essentially uh, you have Frank coming back to life, um, but he comes back to life in pieces. Like his soul and his consciousness are there. Yeah. Well, Frank's soul is kind of weird, but like his consciousness is there. Uh, the, his first shot where he oozes up from the floor, he's a skeleton. And then slowly his body puts on layers of like muscle and fat and skin, like, uh, and, and it rebuilds itself. Yeah, like every time they go back to check in on how Frank's doing, he's a little bit more of a person. Yep. And it's all with the help of Julia going to bars, hitting on men, and then bringing them back for Frank to kill. Poor Larry out of this so whole situation. Weird. No, it's very poor Larry, because something real bad happens to Larry. Um, so during this whole thing, Larry's daughter, Kirsty, um, she ends up spotting her stepmom, Julia, bringing up one of the guys and interrupts the- Hold on, hold on, on. stepmom, Julia now? Yeah. Okay. So basically, yes. okay, I'm trying to follow here. So we have Frank dies. But Frank died after Larry and Julia got together, and with Julia then cheated on Larry with Frank, Frank dies. But Larry was married before then, had a daughter, and then now the daughter's with Larry, and then Julia's there. Kirsty is only ever Larry's daughter, never referred to with the both of them, so I always just assume she's a stepdaughter. Okay. Yes. Um... So that's how that family works. Um, oh, and Frank found the puzzle box because he went to Morocco because he said, I had experienced all the pleasures of the world and I wanted more. And then he like opened the puzzle box, did a ritual, ended up dying because the Cenobites don't differentiate between pleasure and pain. And so they just torture, which hence the working title, The Sadomasochists, um, <laughs> which is pretty much all this movie is. Here's the thing, uh, there has to be like a B movie somewhere out there that somebody made under that title, right? The Sadomasochist from Beyond the Grave or whatever. There has to be. I'm not putting that past anybody. I'm not going to Google it either, I would though. Also not <laughs> Google it at all. You'll end up on a few list. I mean, there's probably a Pornhub for that somewhere. Oh, no. So, sidebar, apparently Pornhub has reported that 741,000 people Googled or searched Joker after four days after the movie, the Joker came out. Oh, no. So, apparently, people on Pornhub are really looking for the Joker. Not into I that at all. I Cenobite exists. Oh, it didn't show. This oh, is a new kind of horror episode. So, Hellraiser. Anyway. <laughs> So, solving this puzzle box. So um, you know how sometimes so. Rubik's Cubes let out demons? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's Hellraiser. <laughs> Not wrong. Um, so I did yeah, see a fun, goes... fun fact about Rubik's Cubes. Which I don't know if it's true, but they said that basically every Rubik's Cube, no matter what the thing, is 20 or less moves away from being solved. I don't necessarily yes. buy that. But is that true? I think that actually is true. Okay. I get very angry when I do those because I can't complete them, so... I don't know. That's why you take a pencil and pop them open, then you put it all back together once you get tired. <laughs> no, you just learn all the algorithms. That's what I did. Well, that's also true, apparently. <laughs> there are three very different personalities on this podcast. <laughs> that's fair. That was actually, yeah, those were three very different approaches to Rubik's Cubes. <laughs> was it anger, cheating, and learning? <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway. But two the of the three got solved. <laughs> Anyway, uh, so yeah, the puzzle box was from Morocco, which made more sense when they were British. Um, yeah. But 
he he picks up the 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 box and Morocco goes forth unleashes it and essentially he ends up dying in the cold open of the film um so throughout this entire process uh Kirstie's is she doesn't really know she it's weird real weird family dynamic but Mm -hmm. eventually she ends up uh she spots Julia taking a man upstairs and she's like well damn this she's cheating she's cheating on dad follows him up and then she ends up catching Frank killing and drinking the blood of the guy and so then Frank goes after her she escapes and she winds up in the hospital where she releases the Cenobites Um, and this is where we get into the part where uh, Pinhead is the hero in that Pinhead comes out, wants to take her with him because that you summon them, you want them to take her with you. Yeah. And then she straight up says, hold on, Frank's still here and he escaped you guys. And then it turns into the Cenobites going to, g- to collect Frank. Um, they're, they're just trying to make good on a contract. Pretty much. Um, and so she makes a deal to deliver Frank to them in exchange to keep her own life. And then... Uh, what happens is when she goes back to deliver him, and this is where we get real, oh no, poor Larry, uh, Frank, almost complete, decides to skin his brother and wear his skin and essentially become Larry to throw off uh, the Cenobites. It's horrifying. And again, poor Larry. Yep. Larry gets the very, very short end of the stick here. Um... (laughs) So Larry ends up just laying out, splayed on some chains, and Hell um, Hellraiser, uh, Pinhead ends up coming, and he's like, "Who did this?" And she's like, "Yeah, he's over there." Um, whole bunch of stuff unfolds. Anyway, they end up coming back with Frank. Um, which the other frustrating thing, weird thing, as much as he loved Julia and Julia loved him, uh, after Kirsty refuses to have sex with Frank. Uh, he ends up trying to kill her and kills Julia in the process, in which case Frank's like, oh, okay, blood's here. I'm going to drink this. Um, <laughs> totally disregarded the worst. Kill Julia. <laughs> um, after the Cenobites finally get Frank, they end up going back on their deal and they try to take Kirsty as well. But by solving the puzzle box, she ends up being able to send them back to hell and she escapes with her boyfriend as the house collapses behind them. Where did the boyfriend come? It, he's there. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, it's a movie. It's it's a real good movie. It sounds real convoluted when I lay it out like yeah. that. Um, but the the most amazing parts of this movie really come from how it uses uh, religion in it and also how it uses practical effects. So all the, and that's the, the major, one of the major, but why those is a uh, Bob Keen. So Bob Keen did all the practical effects designs in, in, in this movie. And so essentially the special effects artists, uh, when they talked, uh, when they talk about working with Clive Barker is essentially they had to, uh, keep up with his pace because even though Clive Barker didn't hmm. know what he was doing he was like go 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 all the time and so the practical effects team and it, it isn't negative like they worked with him and it was a really good yeah. set but there were just a lot of issues because because this was Clive Barker's work he wanted stuff to look a very very certain way so like initially Pinhead had like these six inch nails that would stick out of his head and they were really thick and clunky and so they actually had to debate on putting in the pins, like uh, something that was really, really thin and sleek. Um, but beyond that, and I think Frank and uh, Alex mentioned it, uh, Frank is played by two different people. He's played by somebody when he's unskinned Frank, and then he's played by somebody else when he's skinned Frank. And a lot of that just had to do with time and makeup. Um and ultimately, what this film is known for, I mean, when you think of 80s horror, you think of gory kills, but you don't think of art fil- artful kills. You don't think of practical effects that are made to be large, giant set pieces. 
um, outside of something like The Thing, but I think Thing mm-hmm. is in 79? No, well, there's one in the 80s. The, the Bob uh, Carpenters is in the 80s, I'm pretty sure. Is it 80s? Oh, yeah, 82. 82. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, like, the thing, the thing and Hellraiser are, like, the two standouts when you look at practical effects and what can be done. Um, but the other cool thing about Hellraiser is uh, a lot of the religious stuff that gets said by Pinhead is actually made up by Bradley. The Jesus wept line. So at the very end of the film, um, Frank comes back together and he thinks that he's escaped hell. But then the Cenobites just pull him apart again. And uh, Pinhead says, Jesus wept. Um, and it is one of the most like, oh, this is this yeah. is real messed up. Because they use all of these biblical phrases for all of the torture that they're doing. And it it gets real messed up. But that line in particular, Bradley said. Um, mm. He was supposed to say something else. And he just decided to just say that. Um, and it works extremely well in the film. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. Um, the other major but why, though, that comes from all of this is the Cenobites. Because they're iconic. Even if their names are Butterball. <laughs> the, like, the names are terrible. The look is incredible. Like, it's such a specific aesthetic of, like, this weird, like, torturous version of the Matrix. Like, it's, it is sadomasochism to an extreme. Yeah, all of the all of the Cenobites were uh, all of their costuming, all of their designs were taken directly from the costume designers and Clive Barker going to like BDSM clubs. Oh, interesting. That makes yeah. a lot of sense, honestly. It's all based on BDSM culture and everything that like it's taken to the extreme. Uh, yeah, obviously. Well, and it's funny because like the the original premise of the of the film, if you take it away, like is this woman's like the, uh, some form of her like former affair is there. And she's like, OK, to what lengths would I go for the gratification to bring this man back? Like, what am I willing to sacrifice of my own humanity and of literally other people? And like you almost don't need the Cenobites to make that work but they yeah. do elevate it. Like it, like it is a story that would stand on its own if it was just like, I don't know, black magic and the devil, whatever. Like we're skipping past it. But instead it's like, oh no, here's this whole other lore that's going to make this world so much deeper and bigger. Um, mm-hmm. And in a lot of ways, like weirder and scarier. Yeah. And, and it, cause that's at its heart, um, at its hellbound heart. Um, that like, this is a love story. And this is a love story that Clive Barker wrote, so it's real messed up. But the crux of it is what Alex just said. It is about Julia doing what she can to bring back to life the man that she loves. So when Julia is murdering people, she's not... um, So like like Barker said, she's not committing murder in the way that Jason from Friday the the 13th films commits murder just for the sake of bloodletting she's doing it for love so there's a sympathetic quality about her enhanced hugely by in estimation by the fact that claire higgins does it so well and claire higgins is the actress who played julia Mm -hmm. um that's what's at the core of this and which is honestly why i do agree with you alex and hellbound heart is a better freaking name yeah i mean this is ultimately romance horror even if the romance is misguided exactly all this does is, is confirm something? that this is mm-hmm. Soundgarden. What? All this does is confirm this is Soundgarden. It really <laughs> does. <laughs> People uh, are going to go down a rabbit hole after this episode of just Googling Pinhead Soundgarden. I guarantee it. They really it. are. They really, <laughs> really are. Um, but yeah, so... While... Because it... It, how do I say it? Hellraiser is the Cenobites, um, but because of the marketing around the Cenobites and what their names are, you pretty much miss a lot of the love story, which is the crux of it. Um, it's there if you pay attention to it and, and you're going into this film for something more than just, uh, to use Clive Barker's words, a bloodletting, um, which is why you have, like I said earlier, there's this difference in uh, what type of horror and what type of horror fans this film is made for. Um, so Cenobites, as they exist, are extra-dimensional beings who appear in the novella The Hellbound Heart. 
and the sequels, The Scarlet Gospels and Hellraiser The Toll, as well as all 10 Hellraiser films. It's too many. 10. <sighs> so this all goes back to my theory as to why horror fans aren't the most toxic fandom. It's because everything we love gets 10 films and we hate nine of them. So we're not scared of change. No, not at all. <laughs> we were born into this. We actually, uh, on Fright Day, we just did kind of as like, I guess like a tongue-in-cheek a tongue in cheek thing. We did an article where we reviewed Jason's masks from the Hollow or from the Friday the 13th movies. Yeah. Uh, but specifically from like a fashion perspective, because all of them are just like changing up just a little bit and like re-envisioning. It. It's like, what if this time he's in outer space and the mask is made out of metal? And we're like, I don't know, whatever, fine. Like... <laughs> And yeah, like horror just is, I think of like a franchise will just completely run away with itself. And we all sit there and like keep enjoying the first one. And like, maybe if a good one comes out later, we'll watch it. But we're like, ah, it's fine. Do your own thing. Yep. <laughs> Except for Scream. Scream is the only franchise that I will repeatedly watch all four movies. Fair. But there was five. There's four. And a TV show. And a TV show. And a TV show with a uh, movie special. And then a third season that has nothing to do with anything else. Yep. Third season's actually not that bad. I have to start it still. It's pretty good. And it's pretty good in the way that it's good because it acknowledges what Scream was doing and does it in a 2019 way that's really weird. Not oh, Scream okay. 4 level meta, but like uh, the way it plays with tropes and stuff. It, nice. Watch it. it. It unfolds its meta self at the very end. I am excited to watch it. Um, I liked it. Um, but yes, so the Cenobites themselves are theologians from a religious sect in hell known as the Order of the Gash, describing themselves as explorers in, in the further regions of experience and granting sadomasochistic pleasures to those who call upon them. Author David McWilliams notes that the Cenobites are described in more explicitly sexual terms in the book compared with their depictions in the film adaptations. Julia uh, was Barker's choice to carry the series as the main antagonist after Hellbound, reducing the Cenobites to a background role. However, fans rallied around Pinhead as a, back as a breakout character and Higgins declined to return to the series. In the Ashgate Encyclopedia of Literary and Cinematic Monsters, David William writes that the Cenobites provide continuity across the series as the stories become increasingly standalone in nature, um, which is also why I've only seen the first three and bits and yeah. pieces of the other one. I also want to note that Explorers in the Further Regions of Experience is also a better title than Sadomasochist from Beyond the Grave. Yes. <laughs> but now I really want to see a film called Sadomasochist from Beyond the Grave. That's, al that's also I probably a ska band, right? That has to be. Oh, man. Um, so when we look at the Cenobites that we get in the first Hellraiser movie, we're going to talk about Butterball first because we have to. And I will put a picture of all of them. Um, they Their introduction into the Hellraiser film looks like they're about to drop the hottest track <laughs> yep. ever. It's so good. Do any of them have lines other than Pinhead in the first movie? I don't think so. Unless the chatterer's chattering count. No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you have Butterball, who uh, was brought to life by Simon Bedford and is uh, a very, very large man with no ears, but somehow wears glasses. Um, they they look like welder's like, goggles that are like suctioned onto his face. Yes. And he's he's very scary and he deserves a better name than Butterball. Oh, um man. and this is, these are just from the first film. Then you have female Cenobite. It's who, so bad. Uh who was played by Grace Kirby in the first Hellraiser and Barbie Wilde in Hellbound, the second Hellraiser movie. And uh yeah, she essentially has a vagina in her neck. I'm not joking. That is what it was. It was. It's what it's designed to look like. Of. Yeah, it's I think in fiction, it's like 
her throat is cut open and then there's like metal like uh arms holding it open but it yes. clearly is just a vagina that but that they meant it to look like that is what yeah. i'm saying it's yeah it wasn't an accident yes <laughs> they purposely it, they Giorgio o'keefed it they knew exactly what they were doing um she looks cool but she's her name is female centibite so <laughs> Uh, then you have the Chatterer, who is probably the most disturbing looking because he has no eyes. And all of the skin around his mouth is pulled back to just reveal his gums and his teeth. It looks like a horse it, mouth. It's it's terrifying. And it just, like, it chatters. It makes a very disturbing chattering sound, and I don't like it. No, it is it is my least, like, the most horrifying of them, my least favorite of them. Yeah. I would take a selfie with Pinhead. I would not get anywhere close to the Chatterer. Nope. Looks like he's going to bite you. He's so scary. Matt, how, how do you rank the, the Cenobites? Uh, I mean... I don't know, because these are weird names and they're throwing me off. Have we even got to all of them yet? I don't think we've done all of them, have we? No, there, there are more. Yeah, I was like, I thought we had a few more here. I have. Uh, we have to oh, there's those. a lot. Yeah. Especially if you branch out to like, the comics and everything. Yeah, so these are just 10 from the films that I found. Um, there is a camera head from Hellraiser 3. He has a camera in his head. And then there is CD head. Which, at least he has up, CDs. They're updating with the times, at least. In his head. <laughs> from Hellraiser 3, Hell on Earth. Um, the coolest one is actually Angelique, who is from Hellraiser 4 Bloodline. Um, she has the top of her, uh, the top of her scalp split, and it's, the flaps are pulled with pins attached to her shoulders, and it exposes a section of the skull. Um, people are gonna think I'm real weird. Uh... They probably already do, but... Honestly, this feels more in line with, like, early Cenobite design than Camera Head or CD Head. Yeah, yes. Camera Head and CG Head are just weird. Like, I don't know why they were a thing. Um, but Angelique is actually really, really cool. Um, she's really, really good looking design-wise. Uh, she you're entirely right in that she's more in line with it. Um, the only difference is that all of the Cenobites, including female Cenobite, are completely covered in clothes. Um, and she has more skin exposed. And here's another picture of her um, than the other ones. But yeah, so Angelique's pretty cool. Uh, if I remember correctly, the actress who plays Angelique was is actually like a character character in one of the movies. Oh, and interesting. She turns into a Cenobite, I think. I could be completely Right, because Cenobites used to be human, right? Yes, all Cenobites used to be human. Um, and then uh, the other one from the first Hellraiser film that you only see in the first Hellraiser film is the Engineer. Um, he doesn't look human at all. Um, and he's more of like a beast, like a twisted beast. Like he has, like his body mm -hmm. is like turned around and it's real weird it's, it's real weird we real terrifying like he's a quadruped um it's yeah it hold on but yeah and then you have a uh, dr chenard uh he is of the chenard institute and he has always been a bad guy and he just looks like a regular human and has like a hand on his head Mm. he ain't that cool looking um there are way more cenobites i mean there are 10 movies with new cenobites for each of them um i do think that these are probably the most notable ones um i did forget cd head was a thing he real bad <laughs> <laughs> it's so bad um but yeah i think my like my favorite cenobites overall like favorite as in most mm -hmm. terrifying is the chatterer yeah, it's pretty pretty scary. Matt. Yeah, I mean he looks terrifying, I guess. Matt's more into camera head. Yeah. <laughs> Is CD head your favorite Cenobite? 
No, I'm good. I don't know. I don't really pick my favorite Cenobite. I guess I just didn't think that out. <laughs> we need an answer, Matt. We need to know why you love Hammerhead and whether or not you think he uploads videos to Vine. <laughs> TikTok, but in man. hell. Get it right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It is hell. So TikTok. <laughs> he hopefully has a big camera. TikTok. TikTok. Oh. Yeah. <sighs> anyway, Cenobites are real weird. Uh, some are great. Some are iconic. Some are camera and CD heads. There's also Piston Head, and those last three all feel like it's just a regular person with something jammed in their face. <laughs> yes. It's kind of lazy design. <laughs> very, very much. Um, so one of the other really, really cool things, and it's but why, though, is Hellraiser was a lot worse than what we get as a finished product. Which is crazy. Product. Yeah. So uh, the MPAA initially gave the film an X rating. Um, and after cutting a lot, it got down to an R rating. So one of the things that, that they said to you that really sucked was when the APAA gave them their rating, they just said, this is too intense. And they didn't give them any guidelines to change. Because yeah, because that's not a review. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, usually... They'll be like, X scene went on too long for X amount of things. You showed a left booby. You can only show a right booby. That kind of stuff. And style. instead they just went, oh, oh boy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly. And Clyde Parker was like, so what do I cut? <laughs> um, ultimately, two and a half shots were excised from the first hammer murder. Um yeah, they they killed they killed the man's with hammer, with hammer. It's real brutal. <laughs> um, uh, including a close up of the hammer getting lodged in the victim's head. Yikes. Uh, in the scene where Julia murders another man, the actor playing the victim felt that it made it it made sense for him to do so naked. Um, the nude murder scene was shot. <laughs> <laughs> but ended up getting replaced with a semi-nude version. I feel like that always works the other way around. <laughs> right? I don't want my clothes on in this scene. <laughs> Especially if I'm getting murdered, I need to be no, nude. Here's the, nude. There is a movie where that happened, and it's the uh, the 2000s remake of My Bloody Valentine. There's a whole opening oh, sequence yes! where this woman's running around naked, and apparently she was supposed to have a sheet that she was holding to her chest, but she kept like tripping on it or dropping it or the wind blowing it out of her hands, and so eventually she was like, can I just do this sequence naked? It'll be a lot easier. <laughs> Because, yeah, the first time I watched that movie, I'm like, this is weird that, like, the first movie, like, the original had no nudity in it. And this movie has opened up with a solid, like, three minutes of a woman running around naked. And then I was reading <laughs> trivia and found that. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> okay, uh. let's see. What else? Close-ups of Kirstie sticking her hand into Frank's stomach and exposing his guts were cut. No. There is a longer version of the scene where Frank is being torn into pieces by the Cenobite's hooks. All right. Cut that too. Um, which makes sense because the very first time we see him get torn, it is literally just a piece of back or some sort of skin with two hooks going in. Yeah. And then it cuts. We don't see anything else other than that. Like we ought, we hear it, but it cuts. Um, and that then seems it, worse to just hear it. It does. And, and the reason you know something bad happened was you have one of the Cenobites walking through the room that has it's dangling with chains and you just see chunks of human all on the floor. This is simultaneously making me want to rewatch Hellraiser and making me not want to see that movie ever again. Yes. <laughs> chunks of human. Um, I feel real bad for anybody who's like, oh, I want to learn about Hellraiser today and are learning these things. Yeah, if you already if you didn't already know about Hellraiser, this episode might be upsetting. It's been thirty <laughs> years; you'll be fine. Um, so the final shot where uh, Frigg's head explodes and his brain messily splashes out—that was cut. Um, 
In an interview with Sam Hain magazine in 1987, Barker mentioned some problems that censors had with the more erotic scenes in the film. Um, and he said this, well, we did have a slight problem with eroticism. I shot a much hotter flashback sequence than they would allow us to cut in. Mine was more explicit and less violent. They wanted to substitute one kind of undertone for another. I had a much more explicit sexual encounter between Frank and Julia, but they said no. Let's take out the sodomy and put back in the knife. <laughs> what in the hell is wrong with the MPAA? Like, yeah, sex, no. Knife play, yes. Well, specifically, they were objecting to sodomy. Yes. Like we don't we don't want to see them do that, but if you would like them to sexually cut each other, go for it. What? It's actually a really freaking disturbing scene. Like rewatching it. Yeah. He like so she's staring Julia and it's, it's at the very beginning of the film. Julia is staring into what was his room and is imagining the first time she cheated on uh La- poor Larry cheated on Larry with him and it's like in the middle of Larry being rushed to the hospital because he cut his hand open Oh, and he, she's just staring and she's thinking about it and it's just Frank with like a switchblade and like cutting off her the like the strap on her shirt and her being like oh no and then him being like knife move it's ridiculous real scary it's real weird yeah um that was okay though the mpaa is weird watch the documentary this film is not yet rated oh yeah i have seen that it's, it's real bad so um, speaking of our patreon stuff just because it's funny so we did the review on airplane and i don't know if you all I mean you all remember airplane between like you actually see some boobies flying around in that movie and you see a bunch of other stuff that they do and some bad jokes and people like hang themselves, you know, just funny comedy or whatever. The movie's rated PG. Can we just pause and, and take a minute for the part where Matt said some people hang themselves, you know, comedy. That's literally the comedy of the movie. There's people just killing himself every time he tried to talk to somebody. And that movie is rated PG. Yeah. Well, I mean, PG 13 didn't exist until like 1986. So we have a lot of messed up ratings. <laughs> <laughs> there are so many movies that were rated PG that you look back on and you're like, what the hell was wrong with you people? <laughs> I think Jaws was rated PG when it came out. Even though it the, oh, so Jaws has one of the best opening scenes in the history of film ever. Let's go skinny dipping. Nom, 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 nom. <laughs> That's Jaws. So you want to say something? Sorry, no, I was just looking up. Jaws was, yeah, it was rated PG when it came out. <laughs> we just let anybody we just let anybody see anything back then. <laughs> oh, but here's a listicle of movies that were also rated PG. Oh gosh. Uh Jaws is the first one on this list. Uh this is from moviephone.com. That's still a thing. Apparently. Uh Watership Down. Uh, Mommy Dearest, <laughs> Raiders of the Lost Ark, Poltergeist, <laughs> Gremlins, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. You know where a man Wait, gets actually, his... actually, they blender a full-ass animal in Gremlins. Um, yes. Back to the Future, which... Uh, Beetlejuice, Big, uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Dead Poets Society. Yeah, those were all PG movies when they came out. Great times, great times. Wow. The 80s were wow. wild. <laughs> they were so wild that we got to X ratings and we had to cut it back for knife play. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to put a disclaimer on this episode. Like, I really am. Oh, people need to know what they're getting themselves into. They do, though. I don't want to be like, Hellraiser was great. Love Clive Barker. Go watch it on Shutter. <laughs> Bring your like, if people look at the show notes for this, they're going to know whether or not they can handle this episode. That's <laughs> Just fair. based on the pictures. <laughs> <sighs> okay. Continuing. Parker also said on the commentary for the film that the seduction scene between Julia and Frank was initially a lot more explicit. We did a version of the scene which had some spanking in it, and the MPA was not very appreciative of that. 
Lord knows where the spanking footage is. Somebody has it somewhere. The MPAA told me I was allowed I was allowed two consecutive buttock thrusts from Frank, but three is deemed obscene. An- another way that the MPAA is very weird, that they will draw a line like that, of like, it's fine if you have this person having sex for two thrusts, but the third, that's too much. Yep. I just love how the MPAA just hates sex so much, but we just don't mind the violence. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, they did mind the other violences, like a brain slashing yeah. out of a skull, and... We have bodies on, like, fish hooks. Yeah. They cut a lot of that out, though. Anyway. Continuing. <laughs> um, uh, the final but why, though, is just the fact that Hellraiser, Pinhead, and all of his lovely little Cenobites have created a giant-ass world that has expanded well beyond Clive Barker, very sadly, to fans and to Clive Barker himself. Um, so there are 10 films in total. The first one, Hellraiser, was written and directed by Clive Barker. The second one was directed by Tony Randall, written by Clive Barker and Peter Atkins. So for the second one, Clive Barker wrote the original script, and then they weren't going to let him direct it because they didn't like his script. And so then they rewrote the script and then had somebody else direct it. That's just yeah. the whole like taking people's property. Because that's the same thing with John Carpenter and Halloween of just like, we're going to yep. take this from you. And also Friday the 13th. That was not supposed to be all about Jason. Yep. Yep. I mean, Halloween was supposed to be an anthology film. So was Friday the 13th. Really? Yeah, after so they did the first movie, uh, and then they did the second movie with Jason, and then after that it was supposed to keep the idea was just that the day Friday the thirteenth was cursed and that there would be some different terrible thing every movie, but Jason yeah, makes, trended so makes, well. We, I thought you knew makes, this. So, we've discussed this before though. Huh? I was like, We've discussed this before. Have we? Yeah. Even I know that. <laughs> I was like, I know that actually. I know it's fine. It's just it bums me out because I feel like that would, that's a much more interesting franchise. I do know that Friday the Thirteenth number six, I think, is the meta one. Is that the one where that where part? Jason is actually an impersonator? I don't know if it's. I just know they have like Jason playing cards. Oh, weird. Yeah, or something like that. Huh. I don't know. Anyway. I'm still actually surprised we haven't done a Friday the 13th episode. You should, definitely. Also, I want to read these Hell uh, Hellraiser movie titles. Do we, do we want to do that real quick? Yes. Because they get increasingly bad. So there's Hellraiser, and then there's Hellbound, colon, Hellraiser 2. And then after that, they abandon that title format. And it's just like Hellbound, or Hellraiser, colon, and then whatever the title is. So we have uh, Hellraiser 3 it's is like, Hell on like Earth. Book of Sh- it's like Book of Shadows, Blair Witch 2. Yes, uh, and then we have Bloodline, Inferno, Hellseeker, Deader, Hellworld, Revelations, and Judgment. I think Hellraiser, Hellworld is my favorite. I don't know, Deader is up there. Deader <laughs> is very up top. there. <laughs> and those came out the same year, Matt. Oh, they did come out the same year. Oh, man. I like how they have these, like, those come out the same year, and then there's, like, a six-year gap, a seven-year gap. Then they have like they come out every four years for like for like over almost two decades. Yeah, from like so, from the second until the fifth one, they come out every four years. So oh, I, I forgot. Hellworld is the one that's about a video game. <laughs> oh, I dear. forgot. I like how the director directs all of the the same one from between Deader and Hellworld. So I actually want to see, that's from Scott Derrickson's, which is uh, Inferno in 2000. And I want to see it just because it's Scott Derrickson. Uh, he did Doctor Strange, Matt. Um, but it looks real bad. Like, Pinhead don't look like, he looks real bad. <laughs> yeah, honestly. Pinhead put on some, like, muscle, it looks like. Yeah. Jacked Pinhead. <laughs> yeah. Detter. What was Detter's premise? I didn't bother reading it. I the Wikipedia article says that it's an American Romanian film, and that alone is confusing. What? Oh, it does. 
They gave up. A reporter up. investigates an underground group that can resurrect the dead, much to Pinhead's dismay. They gave up at that point. Oh, dear. Oh, that's so bad. I'm not going to... I can't read this. All right, can you uh, go? Next, <laughs> next, 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 next media. We got to move thing. on. Anyway, so there are, of course, the novels. Um, so there is an anthology book based on um, Hellraiser consisting of 21 stories entitled Hellbound Hearts, and it was released in 2009. And then you also have the Scarlet Gospels, which is a sequel to the Hellbound Heart and a crossover with uh, Clive Barker's Harry John Morris um, uh, stories, uh, which was written by Barker in 2015. And then you have Hellraiser the Toll, uh, set before this, the Scarlet Gospels and after the Hellbound Heart, which was written by Mark Allen Miller and published by Subterranean Press. Uh, and then in 2016, Paul Kane, Arthur, Sherlock Holmes, and the Servants of Hell, which brings together the worlds of Hellraiser, Answer Arthur Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes. Why? So, that actually sounds kind of cool. You're on your own on that one. Are you telling me that Sherlock Holmes wouldn't investigate a puzzle box that brings me No, he things? absolutely would. It just seems like something we don't need. Yeah, we don't want that. We could have gotten a Michael Myers versus Hellraiser movie. That was a thing that almost happened. Yeah. But it may it, it it may or may not be better or worse than Buster Rhymes fighting Michael Myers. That's true. That is kind of hard to match. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you go into the giant world of comic books that came from Hellraiser. So Epic Comics. They're gone. They don't they don't exist anymore. Um, they were so but epic. They had the they had Hellraiser from 1989 to 1992, which lasted for 20 issues. Clive Barker's book to, Book of the Damned, a Hellraiser companion from 91 to 93, which is four issues. Hellraiser versus Nightbreed Jihad. That just sounds not good. Which lasted for two issues. Epic Book One. Lasted so 1991 is that from Desert Storm? Yeah. Okay. That that aligns. Uh, then you have Hellraiser collected book. Hellraiser 3, the film adaptation. Hellraiser Summer Special. Hellraiser Holiday Special. Which I, I was about to ask when we get really the Hellraiser Christmas Special. <laughs> I really want to see that. Um, then you had Pinhead. Wait, what's the Summer Special? Oh, it's got to be got to be some beach shorts. I swear. And a surfboard. Like... But he's surfing on oh. a surfboard made of people. I'm so let down. What is it? If he's not wearing latex shorts, I don't know why we're here. Yeah, it's... Oh, yeah, that's very disappointing. I'm extremely disappointed. We had, like... <laughs> we had Mecha Pinhead Santa. And then we just got this. I at, le like, I at least wanted him to, like, I don't know, have some, like, sunblock on his nose, some zinc or something. Actually, this is a better quality one. It's a... It's a... It's a large, if you click it, it'll get real Oh big. my gosh. It's a way better quality. Why is he so big? I don't want to. All right, let's get the hell out of here. It's been an hour and 15 <laughs> minutes. I've had enough of this yet. shit. Then there is Pinhead versus Martial Law. Mm. I'm sorry, Play what? Bark <laughs> Pinhead versus Martial Law. Next, you have Clive Barker's The Harrowers. Clive Barker's Hellbreed. Hellraiser Spring Slaughter. Excellent. <laughs> Gotta be the best one ever. I, I think I've learned why Epic Comics is no longer around with these uh, topics. Oh. Real letdown. Yeah, I don't know how the holiday one ended up being what it was. What the? That could have been the summer special and I would have been fine with it. Remember when Clive Barker just wrote a novella and really liked it and wanted to turn it into a single movie? <laughs> <laughs> her body looks all... Her body doesn't match. 
anatomically correct. It would well, maybe Rob Liefeld drew it. Okay. I was like, it looks, her shoulders and stuff did not match, like, the rest of her body. To be fair, that is the bulk of all female, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. characters. I mean, I understand, but it's just, like, her, the dimension, to 1999. the dimensions of her body do not make sense, and look how large her neck is. <laughs> I wasn't sure what you were going to comment on there. Uh, Boom Studios did Hellraiser series called Hellraiser, Hellraiser Masterpieces, Hellraiser The Road Below, Hellraiser The Dark Watch, and Hellraiser Bestiary. That is a selection. I also, <laughs> I associate Boom Studios with things like Giant Days and Lumberjanes and Power Rangers. And so yep. the idea that they did a bunch of Hellraiser comics just does not sit right with me. <laughs> I remember. I review the Buffy comics for them, so it's a little bit closer, but still real far off. Oh, yeah, I forgot they did the Buffy reboot. Yeah, it's it's a far cry. Closer, but no. Uh, but I do want to look up and see if they have that there. Um, and then you have Hellraiser Anthology Volume 1 and Hellraiser Anthology Volume 2 from Seraphim Inc. And that's why Hellraiser matters, y'all. Did we get any fan but why those? No. No. To be fair, Do we have you... not actually done we have not actually done that in like ten months. Seems like. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot of hard work, honestly, in our account. Matt, do do sure. you have a why Hellraiser matters? Oh, why Hellraiser? I have no idea. Apparently, all I learned is you took Soundgarden, made it rated R, and here we are. No, um, you made it rated I'm X. Sure that Hellraiser is before that. It's gotta be okay. Okay, so I mean. So, according to Wikipedia, Soundgarden was an American rock band formed in Seattle, Washington in 1984. All right. A couple of years before, but I don't know when the novella was written. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> Hellbound Heart was written in 1986. So, Clive Barker smoked some weed, listened to some Soundgarden, got real sad, and then wrote the Hellbound Heart. Sounds about right. Yeah, that tracks. <laughs> Hold on. One of the first bands names for the we the, so the lead guitarist of Soundgarden. One of his first bands he formed was his vast army of pinheads. Oh shit! <laughs> Wait, is this actually confirming Matt's Soundgarden conspiracy theory? It is. I don't know if it's confirming, but one of his first ba bands is. His first band, Zippy and his fast army of pinheads. It's too much. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Uh, I love Hellraiser. I love it more knowing the giant heap of trash that has spawned up underneath one of my favorite horror movies. Do we really? I do. I, I, I genuinely do want to go through and rewatch all 10 movies. I saw like maybe 45 minutes of judgment before the pinhead design was just like, no, no, I can't. I can't wait to hear what you think about the one about gamers. I really want to watch that one like a lot. <laughs> Please do. Um, But at the end of the day, Hellraiser gives us some of horror's most iconic moments, some of the most iconic practical effects usage, and it gives us all the Cenobites, even, yes, CD head. Um, uh, it has a really solid place in horror, and it is... I mean, after this... Um, after directing this, Clive Barker goes on to direct Candyman, so, like, we need this. We need this yeah. to happen. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah so i love it that's pretty much my only but why though <laughs> or my only that's my fair only personal thing alex soliloquy us out yeah i don't know if i have necessarily a personal uh attachment to hellraiser i really like it as a film and i think it's a really interesting story that clive barker is trying to tell i when i think of hellraiser i think exclusively of the first movie um, I think it matters in that it is one of the more thoughtful horror movies. It pushed, uh, just like f philosophically, I think it pushed people to think more critically about things. Um, if they were the kind of person to watch a movie and try to think 
critically and philosophically about it. Um, and I think just the way that it made use of its budget and the practical effects, like it's a really remarkable movie um, visually and, and thematically. And it came out over 30 years ago. Uh, and that's not really something to write off. I don't know that it matters for the legacy that it has spawned. Um, maybe as a cautionary tale of like not letting uh, corporate greed get in the way of artistic vision. Um, but yeah, I just, I think it matters because it's a really striking film that like leaves you with something to think with if you're willing to engage it. Awesome. Well, I'm happy you were here with us for this exploration. This, this episode was a ride. <laughs> <laughs> That's our job. Yeah. <laughs> No, it was it was great. Also, I loved it. Alex is gone now. At least for this episode. <laughs> it's just it's just Pinhead. <laughs> Alex, why don't you tell everybody where they can find you? Yes, you can find me on Twitter at most always Alex. You can find me on Friday.com where we do genre and horror news and reviews, and you can find me on Game Boys Podcast, which is a co op and multiplayer video game podcast for Goombastomp.com. Awesome. And as always, you can find the podcast at Boy the PC. We are most active on Twitter. Come get at us. And also, patreon.com slash Boy the PC if you want to help support us a little more. And if you want to read my very extensive research notes, um, there's a lot. Um, and of course, all the images we talked about today will be in our show notes on ButWhyThePodcast.com. You're, you're going to wish they weren't. <laughs> That's specifically why they're going there. It's It's Halloween month. Scary things, but not for the reason you may think. Yes. Um, and you can find me at Obama Randier, Matt. Black Hole Sun. I'm out of here. <laughs>